Rahmatullahi ve Rakatuhu. Bismillah, elhamdülillah, ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillahi ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men vela. Welcome dear brothers and sisters, wonderful to see you again in week two of our series titled Change of Heart. If you remember last week we covered several headings. We started off by looking at why we've chosen this particular topic. I introduced it by saying that post-lockdown conversations with certain brothers of ours and neighbors and friends made it clear that there was a lot of grime that had accumulated on our hearts collectively due to lockdown. And that the real struggle was not so much the physical one, but the internal one. And then if you remember, we went on to cover seven headings as per why this topic is of utmost importance. And then we concluded that section by saying that this study of the hearts is therefore not a wasila, a means. It is an ends. It is something that you study in of itself, not to get you to another science. The value is intrinsic. Then we opened up the topic to speak about the different uh, Arabic terminologies for the human heart. And we spoke about which word? Qalb. And then we spoke about a second one, which was? Fuad. And then a third one, which was? Which was it? Aql, the center of reasoning. Now we start a new session. For me to be comfortable, in order to really begin this study, which will be next week, I, I, I really think that at least two sessions in terms of an introduction to this topic was key, so this is the second introductory topic. Our predecessors lived their lives almost literally with one eye on the world and the other eye looking inwardly, focusing on the heart, not allowing their internal state to play tricks on them. For them, the condition of the heart was an existential priority, much more than our efforts are focused on searching for a physical doctor, a physiological doctor, a financial expert, a career advisor. They placed, however, a huge level of importance of tracking down a spiritual heart doctor that can help them clear away the grime that accumulates from the heart. And they wouldn't have it any other way. And I want to share with you a few examples, starting from the greatest of them all, our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and how conscious he was towards his heart, and then we move our way down chronologically. Imam Muslim narrates on the authority of Al-Aghar ibn Al-Aghar ibn Yasar al-Muzani that our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِنَّهُ لَيُغَانُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِي I sometimes feel that my heart is covered with veils وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فِي الْيَوْمِ مِئَةَ مَرَّةَ And I ask Allah to forgive me 100 times a day Focus on his consciousness of his heart and he said even me who is connected to the heavens with respect to revelation I communicate with angels, Allah has chosen me, I feel sometimes clouds are obscuring my heart. And I ask Allah to pardon me 100 times a day. As for the companions of the Beloved وسلم, they displayed the same level of keenness to ensure that their hearts remain pure. Look at, for example, how the companions would ask the Prophet ﷺ various questions, taking the initiative. They wouldn't wait for an advice to be given to them. They would say to him, Al Sini, please give me advice. How can we improve our internal state of affairs? What can we do? Give us advice. One of them, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, wa aujiz. O Messenger of Allah, give me advice, but please keep it concise. He gave him a three-part bit of advice. If you adhere to it, watch how success will come into our lives. 
He said to him, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ الْمُوَدِّعَ When you get up to pray, treat it as if it's your farewell prayer. Number two, لا تكلم بكلام تعتذر منه غداء Beware of saying something that will necessitate an apology tomorrow. وَأَجِمِ عِلْيَأْسَ مِمَّا فِي أَيْدِ النَّاسِ And never look at what the hands of people possess. Be careless towards it. So look at how the Sahaba, they came to him. Advise me, O Messenger of Allah. عِذْنِي مَوْعِذَ مَوْعِذَ goes to the heart. وَقُلْ لَهُمْ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَوْلًا بَلِغَ Another Sahabi, Sa'id ibn Yazid al-Azdi, he comes to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Awsini, advise me, O Messenger of Allah. Look at the keenness. He said to him, أُصِيكَ أَن تَسْتَحِي مِنَ اللَّهِ كَمَا تَسْتَحِي مِنَ الرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ He said, my advice to you is that you are shy of Allah. Be shy of Allah, the same way that you are shy from the righteous man in your community. Do you see, dear brothers and sisters? And Abu Darda, the companion, he said that Abdullah ibn Rawaha, the companion, by the way, footnote, who is Abdullah ibn Rawaha? The Sahabi who died in which battle? The battle of Mu'tah. So here you have a Shaheed martyr who's talking. You want to know how he ascended those heights? Listen to what his day-to-day looked like. Abdullah ibn Rawaha would take the hand of Abu Darda and he would say to him, Ta'ala, Nu'min Sa'a. Come with me. Let us increase our iman together for a moment. Allahu Akbar. Many companions would say this to one another. Come with me for a moment. Let's just interrupt the business for just a second. Let us increase our iman for a moment. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said the companions would sometimes gather in a halaqa and Amir al mumineen Umar, he would say to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, you know Abu Musa who would recite Quran and angels would make themselves present. And he would say, Abu Musa, recite to us some Quran. Help us soften our hearts. And a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He begins his recitation. And the Sahaba are just there absorbing the kalam, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you see their keenness, brothers and sisters, to never allow that internal compass to go south? In fact, Ibn Abi Mulayka at tabii he said about the companions, أَدْرَكْتُ ثَلَاثِينَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كُلُّهُمْ يَخَافُ النِّفَاقَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ I met 30 companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Every one of them feared hypocrisy for his heart. Every one of them feared hypocrisy, the prospect of being a munafiq. These are qulubun hayya, lively hearts that are brimming with life and light. When you move down to the tabi'een, the second generation, those who came after the companions, you see the same level of attention to the hearts. You have Ar-Rabi' ibn Khuthayma Tabi'i, a second generation Muslim, who actually dug for himself a grave in his living room. Imagine that. He dug for himself a pit, a grave, in his living room that he would use to soften his heart whenever he felt that it was going coarse. When he felt a hardness in his heart, he would go to the living room, he'd remove the plank and he'd sit inside and close it. And he stays there. Imagining what the grave is going to be like. And then he says, رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ رَبِّ ارْجِعُونَ لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتُ My Lord, return me. My Lord, return me. What is he doing? He's reciting from Surah Al-Mu'minun that Allah tells us that when they go into their grave, this is what they will say. My Lord, allow us to go back to the dunya. He would say, my Lord, return me. My Lord, return me. لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتُ So that I may do good deeds in the th- life I've left behind. And then when he begins to sweat and he's suffocated and he can't take it no more, he kicks out the plank and he leaves. And then he says to himself, ها أنت قد رجعت يا ربيع. You've come back, O Rabia. You said, my Lord, return me. You've been returned. فَعْمَلِ الْآنَ قَبْلَ أَنْ لَا تَرْجِعَ So do good deeds right now. Change your ways before a day comes. You will call and you will not be returned. Allahu Akbar. And then you have Al-Hasan al-Basri. 
الحسن البصري تابعي despite being a scholar a مفسر an exegete um, a scholar of a fiqh a judge a counselor an imam he decided to dedicate a halaqa a private halaqa in his home for the likes of these topics that we are discussing this evening purely to speak about the imaniyat the internal spiritual dimensions of worship, hearts, how to rectify them, how to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever somebody would ask a question in that halaqa, in that circle, that was not related to that topic, he wouldn't like it. He'd get flustered. And he would say to his friends, We are here to remember the actions of the heart. We are here to allow our iman to grow. Please leave that question for a different gathering. And once a man called Maymun ibn Mahran said to his son Amr, take me to the house of Al-Hasan al-Basri. So they made their way to Al-Hasan al-Basri. They knocked on the door. They opened the door. They greeted each other. And then Al-Hasan says to him, what brings you here? Maymun, he says, يا أبا سعيد father of سعيد قد أنست من قلبي غلظة فاستلن لي منه أو إمام حسن I feel that my heart has become a little bit harder than usual I'm not the person I used to be from an Islamic perspective so can you help me soften it please what did Al-Hasan do he said to him بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Quran straight away this is going to feature a lot in our discussion this evening. He said to him, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Afara'ayta imma ta'anahum sinin. Thumma ja'ahum ma kanu yu'adun. Ma aghna anhum ma kanu yumatta'un. Three verses. Maymud ibn Mahran passes out. And he's on the ground, his son, his son Amr, he said, my father was behaving and moving his feet like a sheep that had just been slaughtered. He lost his consciousness. What did he recite? He recited three verses from the chapter of the poets where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, tell me, if we were to give them enjoyment for many years, then the punishment that awaited them finally arrives, will they be benefited by all what they enjoyed? These were the verses he had, and he passed out. Anyway, he regained consciousness, and they made their way out. And his son said to his father on the way home, was that Al-Hasan al-Basri, the, the great Imam we, we hear about? He said, yeah, that was, that was Al-Hasan, Abu Sa'id. He said, ظَنَنْتُهُ أَكْبَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ he said, you know, I always had like a bigger picture of the Imam in my mind. I thought he'd be something bigger than that. So his father stopped and he prodded his son in his chest. He said to him, Ya Bunay son, لَقَدْ قَرَأَ عَلَيْنَا آيَةً لَوْ تَدَبَّرْتَهَا بِقَلْبِكَ لَأَبْقَى لَكَ فِيهَا كُلُوم He said, my son, he had just recited ayat from the Qur'an, which if you properly understood them, they would have left so many wounds in your heart. La ilaha, this is the power of the Qur'an. So this, dear brothers and sisters, is a quick snapshot of how our predecessors approached this topic and gave it utmost attention. When was the last time you visited a heart doctor? When was the last time you went to a brother, a person, an individual who you feel is a specialist in the field, or even half a specialist? who can give you advice about your state of affairs and your imaniyat, your spirituality. When was the last time you felt the need to do that? They did that and that is why they were ahead of the game. The second question we'd like to ask now, let's keep this as logically uh, progressive as possible. The second question is, what are the signs of an ilhat? What are the signs that hardness, qasawa, ghilva, has slowly started to creep into your heart? And we said success on the day of judgment is coming to Allah with a sound heart. What are the signs? See, before I answer this question, brothers and sisters, allow me to, us to say this. The greatest punishment for a crime 
is the crime itself. Why? Because the person who does that sin now needs to live with the consequences of that crime for the rest of his life. You have committed a crime and now there is a guilt that lives inside of your heart and it brings about the worst type of pain that is spiritual agitation. So people, they do all sorts to mask that pain, to cover it up, don't they? They try all sorts. They try, they try alcohol, they try drugs, they try fame, they try music, they try to socialize. They try perversity, they try sexual experiment, all in, in an attempt to do what? To cover the pain that they feel. And some people turn to kufr to mask the pain, because after all, what is kufr? Rejection of Allah or disbelief. What is kufr? From a linguistic perspective, it is to cover. And that's where the Arabic word of cover comes from. It comes from the Arabic of kufr. The English cover comes from the Arabic of kufr. So the greatest crime or the greatest consequence or punishment for a crime is the crime itself. And that is why Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, he says, مَا ضُرِبَ عَبْدٌ بِعُقُوبَةٍ أَعْظَمْ مِنْ قَسَاوَةِ الْقَلْبِ وَالْبُعْدِ عَنِ اللَّهِ وَمَا خُلِقَةِ النَّارُ إِلَّا لِإِذَابَةِ الْقُلُوبِ الْقَاسِيَةِ He said there is no punishment in existence that is more severe than being given a hard heart and feeling alienated from Allah. And then he said the hellfire was only created to melt those hard hearts. A rabbi from Bani Israel, he once said, Ya Rabbi, kam a'asika wa la tu'aqibuni. He said, Lord, I disobey you so much, yet you don't punish me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation to a local prophet of that era to go to that rabbi and say to him that Allah Almighty says to you, Kam u'aqibuka wa anta la tadri. I have been punishing you for so long that you just don't realize it. Alam aslubka halawata munajati. Have I not taken away from you the sweetness of being close to me? That is a punishment. Some people don't realize it, to have that hard heart. Think about it. Remember those days when maybe some of you um, used to pray at night, and it was a night in, night out type of thing, and nothing could stop you, and you enjoyed it, you loved it. Where is that gone now? How come some of us can't do that anymore? Is that not enough of a punishment? Or do you think that a punishment always has to take the form of a thunderbolt? Or an earthquake? Or sudden death? Alam aslubka halawata munajati. Have I not taken away from you the sweetness of being near to me? Of calling upon me? Remember those days when you used to call upon Allah and make dua and weep and you enjoyed it so much you can do it for an hour, maybe two. Where is it now? You can't wait, some of us, for the Imam to finish his salah quick enough. As if we've broken free from chains. What happened? Is that not enough of a punishment in of itself? When was the last time you heard a hadith or an ayah and your eyes spilled with tears? When was the last time you shed that for the sake of Allah? If you can't feel it, realize. huh? That's enough of a punishment in of itself. So we are talking now, what are the signs? What are the signs of a heart that has become hard? I'm going to give you a a self-diagnosis kit that has maybe four or five components. Present it against yourself and measure whether this fits you or not as a description. Where is your heart? Sign number one to look out for. How does your heart react when the Quran is recited upon it? Allah yahfad our Imam, may Allah preserve him who recited heart-trembling ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah and the story of Talut and Jalut. How do you react when you hear the Quran recited upon you? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ The believers are those, Allah says, whom when Allah's name is remembered, their hearts tremble. 
وإذا تليت عليهم آياته زادتهم إيمانا And when the verses of Allah are recited upon them, it increases them in iman. وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And they rely upon Allah. Where is your heart facing when you hear the Qur'an? Think about Amir al-Mumin Umar. He is walking in the middle of the night in Medina, checking upon his flock. And he hears a man standing up in prayer, in Qiyam. And he is reciting the verse, إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّكَ لَوَاقِعَ The punishment of your Lord must happen. مَا لَهُ مِن دَافِعَ No one can repel it. Speaking about the punishment that has to befall the kuffar on the Day of Judgment. Umar, he said, قَسَمٌ وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ حَقٍ I swear this is the truth from Allah. And he rushed to his home and he fell ill. And people spent a whole month visiting him. He couldn't leave his house. He was bedbound. Tariqul Firash. Visiting him as a sick person, not knowing that he wasn't sick. It was just the majesty of the Quran. So this is number one from your self-diagnosis kit. Where is your heart when Quran is being recited? Number two. When was the last time you shed a tear in the cause of Allah? Ma'alish. I'm not here to entertain you, my dear brothers, my dear sisters. We want to find answers from the house of Allah. Jalla Jalla. When was the last time you recited the Quran, you heard a hadith, you were in a lecture, you saw something in the streets, and you shed that tear in remembrance of your Lord? A dear brother contacted me not too long ago. He said to me, people are saying that maybe my repentance will not be accepted because I haven't cried about it. Is crying a condition of repentance? I made it clear to him that weeping it's not a condition of repentance. The scholars have made it clear how tawbah is done and what the conditions are. Regret is the most important thing. You don't necessarily need to cry, but at the same token, weeping in the cause of Allah has its place in Islam. Didn't Allah say in Surah Al-Isra, when they hear the Qur'an, وَيَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَذْقَانِ يَبْكُونَ They fall to their faces crying, Allah said. وَيَزِيدُهُمْ خُشُوعًا And they increase in submission. And didn't Allah Almighty say about some Christians who heard the Qur'an? And when they hear the Qur'an being recited, that which was revealed upon you, their eyes overflow with tears because they have just recognized the truth. So it has its place. And that young man who remembers Allah privately and so he cries Allah promises him a place under his shade on the day of judgment when there is no shade but his so it has its place Ibn Umar he said for me to shed a tear for Allah is more beloved to me than to give 1000 dinar of gold in charity because it means something so we said uh, sign number one how do you behave when Quran is recited number two when was the last time you shed a tear in the cause of Allah Jalla Jalalu from His love, from your set sense of indebtedness to Him, your gratitude for Him, your desire to be near Him, your yearning for Him, your sense of warmth and being close to Him. As one brother told us recently in a Umrah trip, he said, Ya Akhi, it was so strange. He's a Reva brother. He said, I was making dua when I was doing tawaf. You remember, he said, I was making dua. And he, I felt as if God was saying to me, okay, okay. He said, it's like I could hear it. Everything I was asking for, it's like I could hear Allah saying to me, sure, no problem, you've got it, it's all yours. When was the last time your eye shed a tear in the cause of Allah? Number two. Number three, test your heart with this. How do you behave when advice is given to you, Akhil Karim? How do you behave when someone calls out a mistake in your dress, in your tone of voice, in your salah, in your hijab, in the way you talk to mom and dad? How do you behave when truth is presented to you? Test the softness of your heart on that basis. Al-Munawi, the Imam, he says, وَالْقَلْبُ الْقَاسِي لَا يَقْبَلُ الْحَقَّ وَإِنْ كَثُرَ الدَّلَائِلُهُ The hard heart will reject truth, even if the evidences are many. It's not about evidences. 
the heart can't receive it. There's a veil. You say to him, my dear brother, may Allah preserve you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, A, B, C, this is not correct, bro. He says, why are, you, why are you even talking to me? Why are you calling out my faults? Why don't you look in the mirror and deal, deal with your own faults? What about your brother? What about your wife? What about your family? He can't hack it. Or you say to our sister, my dear sister, the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, A, B, C. She said, why are you judging me? Don't judge me. You take your male patriarchy patriarchy out of here, you speak to somebody else, right? That is a sign of a hard heart, that you're unable to accept truth or advice, and you resist it. Number four, test your heart with this. How do you feel when it comes to the topic of death? Imam al-Ghazali complained that people during his time were seen laughing and joking in the graveyard. That's as early as Imam al-Ghazali's time. He says people are laughing. During a funeral procession, they're talking. We, me, me, you and I have seen people smoking on the graveyard. And the, and, and the man is being buried right in front of them, transferred to the hereafter. He said people, instead of discussing death, they're discussing the inheritance of the man who's just died. Ya Allah. Whereas Al-Bara ibn Azib, he said that I remember seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat on the edge of a grave, looking inside of an empty grave and crying his eyes out till the soil beneath him was wet. And then he raised his head to us and he said, Ikhwani, brothers, this is what needs preparation. This is what I want you to prepare for. How do you behave when Quran is recited? How do you behave when uh, advice is given to you? How do you behave when you see the sight of death? These are some of the questions that a person can ask himself, herself, to test where your heart is. Is it hard? Is it soft? Does it need work? Now, if you are like me, you come out of an exercise like that thinking, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Right, I've, I've got some work to do. My heart is somewhat hard. What's the next step? Let's go to the next step now. The next step, dear brothers, dear sisters, is to test and trace. You have to use terminology that's in at the moment, right? It's all about test and trace. Test and trace. Trace the cause of that hardness. Where is it? Because if you do it, you'll find it. If you ask Allah to help you, He'll show you. Allah gave you a healthy set of lungs, healthy set of kidneys, healthy set of limbs. He gave you a healthy Islamic heart. I and you, we have corrupted it somewhere down the line. So if you feel that it's not the heart you want it to be, you and I need to go home and check in with ourselves and think, right, where have I gone wrong? Don't blame Allah, Jalla Jalalu. Blame yourself. Because what does Allah say? Allah told us, you started it. You started it. بَلْ طَبَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهَا بِكُفْرِهِمْ Allah said, their hearts were sealed because of their disbelief. So what came first? What came first? Disbelief. And as a result, what happened? Heart was sealed. We started it. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا huh? زَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they first deviated, we then deviated their hearts. So who deviated first? We did. So what happened then? The heart deviated. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَبِمَا نَقْضِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ لَعَنَّاهُمْ وَجَعَلْنَا قُلُوبَهُمْ قَاسِيَةً Because they kept breaking their covenants, we cursed them and we made their hearts hard. So what happened first? They broke the covenants, so their hearts became hard. What I'm trying to show you, dear brothers, dear sisters, is that we started this war. If you think honestly, sincerely, deeply, honestly, unapologetically, you will discover the cause of that heart that had become hard. You or I have introduced a sin between us and Allah or between us and the people somewhere along the lines. So track it down, test and trace, you'll find it. This is the first step. Think about it. Could it be my salah that I'm praying half-heartedly? 
three a day, two a day max, or my salah that is not being done on time, that has an effect on the heart. Could it be my finances, my commerce, haram business? Be honest with yourself, Habibi. Don't go fatwa shopping because you'll find whatever you want. It will not save you from Allah. Haram money you put into your system, it affects the heart. Could it be a fallout that you've had with a relative? You're not speaking to auntie, to uncle, to cousin. A sibling of yours, you guys are not on talking terms. That affects the heart. Could it be because you're spending too much time in town? Could it be, could it be because you raised your voice at your mother? Instant blackening of the heart. Careful. Where is it? Where did it start? If you are honest, Allah sees good in your heart, he'll give you good. Search for it. You will find it. One brother, he told me recently, I have been doing everything under the sun to soften up my heart. I'm not seeing really the result that I want. So on one day, subhanAllah, he said, here in this masjid, in the front row, I am making dua, Ya Rabb. I think I found the problem. There is a person who used to work for me and I think I didn't do him justice. Ya Rabb, please place mercy in his heart. Allow me to, allow me to, Ask him for forgiveness just for the sake of my heart. He said Allah brought him to the very first row as we were praying. We put our hands together, we hugged, and I forgave him and he forgave me. And I am beginning to see khair. I am beginning to see goodness. See? Test and trace. Be honest with yourself. Don't be selective. Flush it all out. When you have found it, you've isolated it, you've made a plan to get rid of those uh, sins or to act upon the obligations you haven't been acting upon now we're ready to speak about the last section from this talk which is what are the rectifiers of the heart what are the things that allow the heart to flourish if that's the type of heart you want then pay attention dear brothers dear sisters you've taken out the illness you've identified it you've removed the obstacle now the heart is ready to receive the wahi, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the vessel is clean. What are the rectifiers? Where do you find them? I will give you, I will give you seven, inshallah. The first of them, and I told you it's going to feature a lot in this lecture. Al-Qur'an, 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 my dear brothers, my dear sisters, and the remembrance of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Nothing in existence will have a greater impact on your heart if you give it attention and you recite it attentively with some understanding nothing will reform that heart more than the book of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Why is that? Because Allah Nazzala Ahsan Al Hadith Allah has brought down the best of all speech Kitabam Mutashabiham Mathani A book of perfect consistency with repeated lessons that causes the skin of the people who fear Allah to tremble. Then their skins and their heart both soften at the remembrance of Allah. This is the effect of the Quran. And I remember the amazing words of Abdul Hamid ibn Badis, the contemporary reformer of Algeria. He said, I swear by the one whom no one is to be worshipped but him. He said, I swear by the one besides whom none, none should be worshipped. In my life, I have never seen anything, despite my sins, he said, and deficiencies. I have never seen anything that is better at softening the heart and bringing down the tear and producing fear of Allah and encouraging repentance than the recitation of the Quran and hearing the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is number one, the book of Allah, Jalla Jalalu. Number two, 
Be wary of becoming obsessively attached with dunya. Easier said than done, right? Careful here, dear brothers and sisters, because you are the Muslims of the 21st century and you're living in a very strange era. The offerings of dunya have not just increased in terms of quantity and availability because of what you see on social media and exposure. No, there is another problem that makes it a little bit more complicated. The offerings of life today, more than ever before, are personalized to fit your nafs, your soul. Dunya is tailored. It's ergonomically designed. It's bespoke to what your desire craves. There's nothing standard anymore about the offerings of life. And you're telling me with all of that, your heart, my heart is going to be unaffected? Impossible. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُولٍ مِّن قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah said, I have not placed two hearts in the chest of any one man. It's the one heart that you and I, the Masakeen, we possess. If it is filled with dunya, خلاص, there's no space for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dunya has opened itself up for, for, for us, especially here in the West. We, by the way, in the West, the average person is living a higher standard lifestyle than kings not too long ago. So not only is dunya available, it is tailored to your taste, tailored to your desire. What do you want? Because it's about you. Think about it. Take uh, coffee, for example. Back in the days, maybe our fathers know this better than us and our grandparents. You just go into any old shop and you say, can I have a cup of coffee, please? That's it. There wasn't... There wasn't anything about that discussion that was complicated because there was maybe two or three dominant brands of uh, coffee at the time they all tasted the same no real competition in the market what is it uh, Maxwell coffee house good to the last drop right that's it can I have a coffee done Bob's your uncle nowadays God help you you want a coffee what type of coffee you're there waiting for a long time just to get to the end of the queue because everyone has a particular way of customizing his coffee. What type of coffee do you want? Well, I mean, what do you want? You want your Arabica coffee? You want your Americano? You want your, uh, your espresso? Your single shot? Your double shot? You want your cappuccino? You want your frappuccino? You want your latte? You want your mocha? What do you want? And then do you want it with milk, without milk, uh, filtered milk, unfiltered milk, semi-skimmed, full fat, or just skimmed, 2% milk? What do you want? You want foam on the top? You want chocolate sprinkle on the top? How do you like it? And then, and then you get to choose your ambience. You know, if, you, if, if you're from maybe Dual uh, Khalij, Allah Yahfad come somewhere from the Gulf, right? We'll see brothers there drinking their coffees, maybe in the, in the Nero, the Cafe Nero's, they like that vibe. And then maybe if you know, you're a young man like yourself, maybe it's, it's, it's the Starbucks. Maybe if you're an old man, a granny like myself, you know, you prefer, you prefer the Costa kind of vibe. It's all there. Tailored to your desire. You're telling me it's not blinding after a while? Olive oil. My father-in-law was saying to me, you know, Ali, back in the days when we first came to this country, that's just my father-in-law, not my granddad. One generation before me. He said back in the days when we wanted to eat olive oil, because Middle Eastern cuisine is heavily based on olive oil. He said, you don't get it in your Tesco's and your Asda's. You had to go to a chemist. It's like a medicine to find olive oil. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, it's a household product, right? What do you want? Your, your, your normal oil, cooking oil, uh, uh, your olive oil, virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, and then premium extra virgin olive oil, filtered, unfiltered, normal pressed, cold pressed. What type of oil do you want? It's all there, tailored to your desire, to your taste. You're telling me that's not distracting? Doesn't affect the heart at all? And then, subhanAllah, these varieties, this tailored design of your desire, it's not just in the halal things. Unfortunately, it's gone to the prohibited things in all of their variations. Take music, for example. Back in the days, what options did you have? I mean, traditionally, uh, traditional cultural society was divided into 
upper class, lower class. And then you had music to reflect upper class, music to reflect the lower class. So you had the upper class type of music, they called it high music. And then you had the, the kind of the uh, commoner type of music, what they called popular music. That's it, really. Two genres. Or in Europe, they call it, uh, they call it um, classical music and folk music. Classical, folk. Nowadays, subhanAllah, it's an explosion of variety tailored to what you want to hear. Look at the genres. There's no end to them. Do you want country? You want rock? Uh, hip hop? Blues? Right? Jazz? Oprah? What do you want? Rap? Metal? It's all there. And then each one of those genres can be opened up into many sub-genres, right? So you take metal music, then you get under it what? Heavy metal, black metal, gothic metal, viking metal, pagan metal, speed metal, power metal. This is a reality. And then each one of those sub-genres has a particular clothing that you wear and a certain type of identity for that genre of music and a certain being of how you present yourself and a certain vocab that you use to identify. You telling me that these things don't distract us? These things don't occupy us? Come on. How is it that all of this access and availability and ergonomically designed desires to fit your preference doesn't somehow end up producing this little mini monster who is always on a tantrum with, uh, with anxiety and stress issues because he wants to get what he wants right now and how he wants it. And if there is a slight delay, she can't take it, he can't take it. That's what we've become, brothers and sisters. We're, we're bedazzled by dunya. We, we can't help it. We've become like that deer that's looking at the headlights of the car and he's just gaping at it and the car is about to hit him but he can't move. That's how so many of us are behaving with the offerings of dunya today, especially here in the West. Staring at it, waiting for a collision course with death to take us by surprise. It does affect us and it is distracting. And some of us are so entangled within the nets of dunya because you see it in their conversation. They can only talk about business and trade and commerce and Bitcoin. They can't do anything. And shoes and makeup, it's a multi-billion pound industry. It's, not distra it's distracting, brothers and sisters. Let's be honest. And that is why Amir al-Mu'minin Umar, he said, إِخْشَوْشِنُوا فَإِنَّ النِّعَمَ لَا تَدُونَ he said, train yourself to live a life of coarseness because blessings don't last forever. Live a harsh lifestyle, he is saying, from time to time. Learn how to be coarse, rough, because blessings don't last. And Fadalat ibn Ubayd, the companion, he said, Amarana al-Nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bittahafi ahyanan. The Prophet ﷺ instructed us to walk without shoes sometimes. SubhanAllah, tarbiyah. He instructed us to walk barefooted at times. Why? Just to remind yourself, you're, you're, you're a poor traveler to Allah. That's what you are. We are poor, weak travelers to Allah. Take off your shoes, remember the reality. Don't get too caught up with your platforms and your Jordans and your air forces. Take them off, remember where are you going, who you really are. SubhanAllah. So we said, number one, the rectifier of the, the Qur'an. Number two, be wary of becoming obsessively attached with dunya. Number three, beware of excessiveness in general. Excessiveness, ikhwani, akhawati, mubalagha, going overboard with everything, it affects the heart, malish. I mean, I'll give you just one example, eating. We have an issue with obesity. And it's one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That people become fat. It's a sign of the Day of Judgment. Right? And the first thing that is affected are not your veins or your heart or your capillaries. The first thing that is affected if you overeat is the heart. You feel it. Imam Ahmad, he was asked the question, 
هل يجد الرجل في قلبه رقة وهو شبح Can a man experience a softness in his heart when his belly is full? He said, ما أرى I don't think it's possible. And Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, for the last 16 years of my life, I have not eaten to my full. Except once. And so I put my finger in my throat and I vomited out everything. And Luqman, there is a surah in the Quran named after him. Luqman, he said to his son, Ay Bunay, son, son, if your stomach is full, your ability to think, to contemplate, will fall asleep. And your wisdom will be silenced. And your limbs will be unable to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, whoever wants to cause his eyes to weep and his heart to fill with khushu' submissiveness to Allah, then you have to eat half full of your stomach. Fill only half of your stomach with food. So we don't know of any uh, influential Muslim reformer who was praised for being a big eater, by the way. All right. Let's make this clear. Badruddin ibn Jama'ah, he said, we don't know of any imam or any scholar of the religion who was praised in his biography for being a big eater. He said, the only things that are praised for eating a lot are animals that are fattened up and then they are slaughtered because they have no minds. But in our culture, it's different. I don't know in the indo pak culture how it is, brothers, but with us, it's like, Mallahi, mashallah, biakul hik. They say, eat this much, mashallah. Habibi, you're not going to hit him with ayn, with hasad. Nothing to envy there. That's a curse. That's not praise. You praise a cow for eating a lot. You praise an ox for eating a lot. You don't praise a human being for eating a lot. Stomach is this big. It's big as your fist. That's all it is. If you want to have a big meal, it has to fit two liters. It grows 40 times. The stomach does not want to do that. And instantly the effects of that goes to your heart. So avoiding excessiveness in everything. Excessiveness uh, in eating. Excessiveness in socializing. Marish. Excessiveness in sleeping. Excessiveness in working. Excessiveness in browsing the net. Excessiveness shopping, spending time in the markets. Too much of it. Excessiveness with laughter. All of these things affect the heart. Excessiveness of everything hardens the heart except one thing, and that is worship. The more you do of it, the softer your heart becomes. Ajeeb, subhanAllah. So this was number what, brothers? This was number? Number three. Avoiding excessiveness in all things. Number four, let us hurry up now. For those who want to rectify their hearts, be in the companionship of good people. You know where to find them. By Allah, there are certain faces out there just by looking at them, without them opening their mouths or saying anything, you feel that your anxieties have left you and your stress has departed. Your chest has expanded. Your heart has illuminated. Just by looking at them, Allah. Some of them are in this room, I swear. Without them speaking. And that is why in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The allies of Allah, the saints, they are those people whom, when you see them, the name of Allah is remembered. You look at him, you can't help but say, La ilaha illallah. Where did that come from? You look at him, you say, Subhanallah. Right? What is a saint, a wali, somebody who walks on the water, flies in the air, Cuts himself without bleeding. Habibi, that's a shaitan. That's not a wali, a saint. <laughs> a saint is somebody whom when you see from the many characteristics, you remember Allah Jalla Jalal. They said about uh, Waqih ibn Jarrah, who is the shaykh of Imam al-Shafi'i, that when people would look at his face, they would say, Hada Malak, that's an angel. Yeah? And Muhammad ibn Sirin, the famous interpreter of dreams, servant of Anas ibn Malik, when they would see him, they would glorify Allah because of the radiance of light that was emanating from his face. 
Ajeeb, subhanAllah. Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he also discusses how they felt when they were anxious and scared and afraid and they would go to their teacher, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, just by looking at him and hearing his words and all of it transforms into strength and certainty and determination and resilience and Iman. Some faces, you look at them, you remember Allah. And there are some faces, you look at them, and what do you remember? You remember shaitan, and you remember sins, and you remember your past ways, and you remember laziness, and you remember urges and cravings and yearnings and haram. These are the faces to be avoided. So we said number four is what? Being in the companionship of what? Of good people. Find them and be with them. Just looking at them is healthy. Number five, being in the companionship of those who are dying and those who have died. If you hear of somebody in your locality who is going through the pangs of death, خلاص يحتضر, he's dying. The process of transfer has begun. If you can gather your nerves, go and seek permission from their family. If you can sit in that room for just a moment and listen and hear the noises and tell me if you come out that room as the same person or not. Tell me if you will struggle to keep your desires at bay after that or not. Try that. لو فارق ذكر الموت قلبي ساعة لخشيت أن يفسد عليه سعيد بن جبير he said if the thought of death disappeared from my mind for just a moment I would fear that my heart was going corrupt. So you can't find somebody who is dying, go to the places of people who've died, sit with them, go to a graveyard, please. Spend some time there. And I remember growing up as a teenager, one of the biggest things that affected me and helped me started to, Danny, we hope we are practicing, we don't really know, but one of the things that really put us on a path was seeing certain brothers in the graveyards on a weekly basis, even during their wedding days, one of the brothers was there in the graveyard in his hoodie, just sat there thinking about death on the day he would get married. That was just seeing someone who was at the graveyard. What about if you are at the graveyard yourself? Do it, brothers and sisters. That is number what? That is number five. Number six, being in your own private company, especially during the depths of the night. There has to be a point in your life, a point in your night, or in your day where you disconnect, you throw away your phone from everyone and everything you've disconnected, and you're connecting only to the creator of the heavens and the earth to think about the big meanings of life. Why am I here? Where am I going? And you will be rewarded. One of the things that began prophethood was an intense desire that he had alayhi salatu wasalam to make his way up to Ghar Hira almost a 45 minute trek and to sit in a small dingy cave big enough for maybe one or two people max and he'd spend days upon days there with no social media no internet no phone just to be alone to think about these values and these meanings of life and Allah rewarded him he sent him an angel and he became a Nabi a prophet and if you do the same, you find moments that you sit with yourself, by yourself, with no one but yourself and your Lord, Allah will reward you and He will give you a station of nearness to Him. What, that's, what is the best time to do this? Allah said the rising of the night is the best way of subduing yourself and giving you upright speech. If that last third of the night was able to speak, it would tell you of the sheer number of sins that were forgiven during it. And the number of people who were given Jannah during it. And the financial burdens that were alleviated during it. And the faults and the crimes and the sins of man that were covered during it. And children from barren parents that were given during it and anxieties and worries that were alleviated during it. Remember, brothers and sisters, give yourself time to disconnect with everyone, everything but your Lord. And don't allow the grind of life to confuse you or to occupy you, even if that grind is Islamic work. 
You need the time to move away from Sheikh Fulan and Imam Fulan and Book Fulan and sit only with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will bring about a light and a tranquility and a comfort and a strength and an excitement and a contentment that no one can describe but those who've experienced it. Try it. Lastly, and I will leave you with this, this is number what? Number seven. For those who are searching for a soft heart, beware of using your heart for other than what it was created for. Your heart was created to do big things. Your heart was designed to glorify Allah. And if you do something with your heart other than what it is compatible with, it will ache and it will start to throb and you will be scared, you will be down. Your heart, imagine that it is like a key that has certain ridges. It only fits perfectly when it is near Allah. Put it in a sin, it is out of place and it begins to burn with pain. Because you're not using it for what it was intended for. Imagine, imagine somebody trying to drink by pouring the water into his ear. Imagine somebody trying to eat using his eye. The outcome of both is what? Damage. Because the ear was designed to receive sound, not water. And the eye was designed to receive light, not food. Similarly, your heart was not designed for those DMs, those private conversations, to sell drugs, to miss salah, to mess about with your hijab, your heart was not designed for that. Your heart was designed to be close to Allah, to glorify Him. And when you don't do that, you will feel pain according to the size and the length of time that you've been engaged in that crime. Remember this. You want to know what a good deed and what a sin does? Listen to the words of Abdullah ibn Abbas. إِنَّ لِلْحَسَنَةِ ضِيَعًا فِي الْقَلْبِ وَنُورًا فِي الْوَجْهِ وَقُوَّةً فِي الْبَدَنِ وَسَعَةً فِي الرِّزْقِ وَمَحَبَّةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ Good deeds, they bring about a light in the face and luminosity in the heart and strength in your body and expanse in your money, your risk, your provisions and love in the hearts of the people for you. MashaAllah. What is the opposite? وَإِنَّ لِلْسَيِّئَةِ ظُلْمَةً فِي الْقَلْبِ وَسَوَادًا فِي الْوَجْهِ وَضَعْفًا فِي الْبَدَنِ وَقِلَّةً فِي الرِّزْقِ وَبُغْضًا فِي قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ And sins they bring about, he said, darkness in the face, gloominess in the heart, weakness in your body, limitation in your rizq, your provisions, and hatred in the hearts of people. Brothers and sisters, we have finished the lecture for this evening. I just want you to do one thing. I want us collectively to not give up, to not despair. If you're knocking on that door and it's not opening, Ya Habibi, you've got two options. Either you turn away from the door and you leave Allah, or either you keep knocking. Which one is more profitable? Some of our predecessors, they said, we learned patience. Al Fudayl ibn Ayyad, he said. I learned patience from a young boy I once saw standing in the doorstep of his mother's house when I was making my way to Salah. His mom was beating him up, punishing him. Then she kicked him out of the house. She said, get out of the house. So he came out of the house and he was very upset. And then he sat on the doorstep and he realized, where am I going to go? So he started to cry. And then he put his head on the doorstep and he was saying to his mom, I'm so sorry. Speaking from behind, forgive me. I have made a mistake. He said, by the time I came back from Salah, she'd opened the door and let him back in. He said, so I stopped and I cried. And I said, SubhanAllah, if a person keeps knocking on the door of Allah, soon enough that door will open. Soon enough it will open. مَا زِلْتُ أَسُوقُ نَفْسِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهِيَ تَبْكِي حَتَّى سُقْتُهَا إِلَيْهِ وَهِيَ تَضْحَكْ One of the predecessors said, I, I kept dragging my soul to come to Allah whilst it was crying. It didn't want to come with me. It was crying until it finally surrendered and it came to me towards Allah, smiling, happy, laughing. Who will win? Keep knocking. It may take you a year, it may take you two, it may take you ten. It took some of our predecessors twenty. But you'll get there in the end. You will get there. And the heart will soften 
and light will come in and you will be the happiest Muslim on planet earth. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to soften our hearts and to illuminate them with the light of Iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to rectify our affairs and to forgive us and our mothers and our fathers and our children and our teachers and all of those who have a right upon us. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد والحمد لله رب العالمين